This is Annabelle Caberti and you are listening to Lawfully Creative. My chance to talk with professionals in the creative industries, to hear their stories, what inspires their creation, what decisions change their careers and what relationships influence their work. Today's episode is brought to you by Crefervy, our London and Paris-based law firm focused on advising the creative industries. Subscribe to our podcast, Lawfully Creative, or catch up with our original shows on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and SoundCloud. Hello, podcast listeners. This is our second podcast of 2017. I am sorry that I have not been more able to edit and publish, release in the public domain the several podcasts that I record in the last few months. I have been very busy in particular with a tax investigation with the French HMRC, IRS, Administration des Impôts, who is proving to be very demanding and uh, thorough in uh, its investigation of uh, my uh, whole taxes. So everything is going fine. I am providing all the information to these guys, but it is taking an enormous amount of my time. So since the beginning of 2017, I spent around uh, 170 hours uh, just going through all my accounts till 2014, 2015, and I haven't done yet 2016. It's, it's going to come very soon and basically running around finding all my invoices and reviewing all my ledgers etc etc and also using with Crefervy's accountant. We had an upsurge of matters and work which is fantastic news and we are really delighted uh, with really interesting and um, dynamic clients coming our way. And in the aftermath of the Cannes Film Festival I thought it would be very relevant to release my podcast done with Phil Turner, who is a London-based film producer and director, which we recorded on the 26th of April 2017 at the Hospital Club in London. So here goes, podcast listeners. Have a great time and don't hesitate if you have any questions to contact us at Crefovi on contact at crefovi.com. With Phil Turner, Phil is a mate that I met a long time ago now, probably five or six years ago, at HTB. Uh, what does it stand for, HTB? Holy Trinity Bronson. Sorry, yes, which yes. is a Church of England congregation, and I used to go there from time to time before I founded my firm, and I had existential questions as to whether I should found my law firm, Crefervy, focusing on the creative industries. So I went to HTB, and through that I met Phil. So probably five, six years ago. How are you, Phil? I'm very well, thank you. The re reason probably we, we stayed in touch with Phil is that Phil also is deeply involved in the creative industries on the film side. Yes. How would you describe your current occupation, Phil? Director, producer. I, I've been one for scarily more than 20 years now. I started out as a 3D animator in the very early days of 3D. Really? In 93. Good group, 93. Uh, Were you working in London or in Shepparton or in London Wynwood? and Norwich? So I was mm -hmm. in the in Wardour Street. That's where our main office was. Okay. And then I, I was using Acrobat, and we had Soft Image as well. Um, and then I became a producer. The next year, I, I I decided I just wanted to produce and direct. Went to broadcast from there. So what were you producing at the time? Creative services, largely creative services for various broadcasters. I launched and helped relaunch four TV companies. So there are a lot of startups as the, the Sky satellite system started getting going. Select TV, Carlton Select, TCC. I relaunched that. I launched the Trouble Channel. Yeah, it was quite creative, fun sort of stuff, really. And I, you're really in at the beginning of, of satellite TV. It felt like. That was in the early early 90s to mid, the end of the 90s. Uh, mid, mid 90s for me, anyway, but early, okay. early to mid 90s, yeah. After working at pretty much every broadcast company in London, I worked for uh, Scandinavian broadcasters too, uh, <laughs> Viasat, for every channel that they, they have. Viasat, um, that's what they're called. Viasat, on a, a freelance basis, yeah. Oh, okay. They have a, a lot of channels under their umbrella. Very much like Sky for, for Scandinavia. For a while, I was at the BBC launching a lot of their new shows and things on BBC Two and then went totally freelance. So a lot of TV work 
Yeah, lots yeah, of maybe. TV work in the beginning. Um, and then you went to the freelance to launch your own company, Film Turner TV and FilmTurnerProductions.com. Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. And just went around the world, did tribal documentaries, frontline documentaries, um, military stuff as, as well. And lots of military stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love working with them. Been on lots of expeditions with them. I've trained a lot with uh, some of their great PTIs, and um, I've made films, recruitment films for them as well. Mm -hmm. So that's great. But also broadcast work, expedition broadcast work, and. Yeah, I might have another one coming up with the military next year. The Fantastic. R the RAF are celebrating big uh, anniversary next year, and they Sweet. they want possibly me to come along on an expedition, but I think I can't really talk about much. Sure. But Fingers I'll, crossed for, for you, yes. man. Oh, hope so, yeah. <laughs> when did you develop your skills as, as a director? Did you go to uni university here in the UK? or? Yeah, Kent, or okay. Kayad it was then, but it, it became part of Kent University. I feel that probably some of the people I've met that went straight into the industry probably learned more than they did people that I know who went to art college. And I, right. I know a lot of my fellow graduates didn't get into the business, really? did running for a few years and earned very little money. And were making cups of tea for people that had actually just been someone's PA yeah. for the first job in the industry and then became a producer straight off the back of the hat. So it wasn't, it doesn't seem particularly fair. And I think probably going on a media degree doesn't help that many people to be honest. What do you think? I think the only thing it helps you with is to get a bit of time to produce your work without any limitations using their equipment to absolutely define the kind of work that you want to do and make it look as professional as you possibly can. Right. Well, and that's a skill set in itself, isn't it? Because it is. I mean, especially at the time, but that was what, in the, eight, no, the late eight, 80s or the, the beginning of the 90s, I suppose, that you went to uni? It was probably work done on celluloid as well, mostly not digital, yeah? Yeah, yeah, so 60 pretty, mil and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty technical, isn't it? It is, it is. I, you do learn some uh, stuff and you do get a passion for it and you get to explore that yeah. passion. And, and for me, it was the new technology. The vision always came before the technical process. So if I had an idea of what visually I wanted to produce, because I started off as an illustrator, a technical illustrator, a photo realist. And I, I loved producing work that looked like photographs, but mm -hmm. actually was using the airbrush, using very, very fine painting tools. And I thought, how can I do that with film? And how can I have a vision and then just see that vision through after having a vision? And that, that was what launched me into learning what I've learned in 3D animation, post-production compositing, all the grading tools, all the special effects tools that I use nowadays, that it didn't start off as a technical issue. It came started off as a creative challenge, and the technical always followed. So any job I've had, usually I've had a vision of what to achieve, and then how do I technically achieve that? And I've usually learned from the best in the business, because you, you're always sitting next to them or over their shoulder, and then eventually you say, well, would you mind moving over and letting me operate that for a while and try seeing if I can do this. How interesting. So it's mainly trial and error as opposed to opening a book and learning from... Well, now it's, uh, it's all website-based. So if you wanted to learn something complex like Maya, which is <laughs> a fantastic 3D animation software package, and you can... There, there are a few good, good ones out there. 3D Mac, uh, Studio Max is good, I think. Cinema 4D is very user-friendly and a very easy one to learn from the outset. I know Sky uses that one a lot, and they've been trying to persuade me to take that up mm -hmm. uh, because then my, our work will be compatible and I would be able to easily work with their teams on projects if I wanted to. Yeah. Maya is pretty much the can-do-all animation program probably the one most used by people like Pixar. Really? And For can, special effects? You can do special effects, character animation, you have fluid effects and lots of plugins like fume effects for explosions and that type of thing. You can, you can basically do anything you want if you have a good enough idea and you learn technically how to put it together in Maya and then can composite it afterwards in, in a number of programs. After Effects is probably the best known. And you can with After Effects and Maya, you can probably produce almost anything that you can possibly imagine nowadays. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's, that's helpful. Now, what are the best software in the industry? There's a lot of good software and there's probably a lot better 
the high-end software than After Effects, but it just shows that someone can actually start producing the kind of effects that 10 years ago would have cost millions and only high-end movies could afford. You can now have kids producing these same effects in their bed bedrooms using this kit, which is very affordable. The same is happening in the music industry where kids are actually in the bedroom creating all albums and then they put them on Spotify, etc. and some of them just uh, explode from the charts. So it's um, it's true, it's a reality. Your take is that perhaps going, having a um, film degree is not going to help you much in your career and maybe you, you're better off just um, being an intern with a great film producer or a great film director. Quite possibly. I, I think we reached saturation point with film degrees probably 10 years ago where they estimated about Half of all degrees were media degrees in the UK, and obviously there aren't that many jobs. There are, there are yeah. some jobs out there, but you, if you're going to do a media degree, you've got to choose it very carefully and very well, and you've got to choose something that's very much professionally biased, not something that's going to be all basically Russian theory. Yes, it's great to look back at Tarkovsky and Eisenstein, but, but basically any kid watching enough movies is going to have enough understanding of the visual language of film uh -huh. to know a good film from a bad film right. when they watch it. The film language is constantly evolving. Yes, you need to be up to date with that, but you need to be technically professional. Uh, it's not probably, according to you, it's not something that you really learn in, in a school. Okay? And have a vision. No, no. Uh, probably um, in some schools, yes. I think there are some okay. very good 3D animation schools in Abbots, but right. you, could, you could do, uh, rather than do that even, I would buy the program any way you can, get any job and get hold of um, Maya, Cinema 40 or whatever, and then get on lynda.com and you, yes, you'll have the best people teaching you okay. these very complex programs. You'll have the screen layout and they'll just click on everything and show you exactly how to do it. One to one wow. tuition for something like $300 a year, which is probably better tuition than you'll ever get at cool. university or, well, or in an art school. In a way, it's the exact opposite of being an elitist, you know? Which, yeah. So basically, what it's you are. Democratized. Yeah, exactly. Totally. It became very democratic democratic to, to get into the film industry. I think this is probably also why it's one of the creative industries where there are so many people who can't really be out of a passion, of a skills as well. For example, in, in fashion, you can't keep on having a fashion business if you're just not successful financially. Yes. But in film, I guess, probably also because there are such low barriers to entry and nowadays you just need a good camera and all the software is available and all the basic tuitions are available almost for free online, Yes, you can easily become you know, a film director or something. Well, with so cameras for a while, they, got, they became quite cheap and easy. It became very, that was a democratizing yeah. factor as well in production. Yeah. Now they get starting to get expensive again, although, really? although they are getting better and better and better all the time. I, like red, for example. Or? Yes, yeah, uh, that's a great uh, production camera. Yeah. It's, it, you use different cameras for different types of things. Just doing a run around shoot type thing for a documentary, and you wanted to get good sound coming into your camera through a radio mic. Mm -hmm. You might just use an F55, which is Sony, and Sony are great for producing cameras that are broadcast quality, but you can pretty much use it as a one man band. But then, if you wanted to go out and, and have a sound man with your production and yeah. you you'd probably use something like Alexa which I use okay. quite a bit and I love being a one-man band I learned all this stuff from some of the best people eventually I don't bother hiring DOPs unless they're the best DOPs in the business mm -hmm. because the news type cameraman that you can normally get for that kind of price would you might as well do it yourself so DOPs being director of photography yes yes you learn a lot from those guys definitely I love shooting my own footage. I don't have with the military anyway, but expedition, you have to pretty much be a one man production yeah, team. Lean. Because you're you're gonna have to get through a kind of selection process with them. Just that you're accepted by the team and that you hold your weight in the team. Right, right, and, right. and they're not gonna want too many civvies okay. messing things up for them. So. Or slowing them down. Yeah exactly. Mm. Exactly right. It's great for tribal work as well. It's great for frontline work. It's great for expedition. What do you mean tribal work? Well I've lived with a lot of tribes. Really? Yeah. And and filming them Where about? South America. Uh, oh. I've, I've I've I suppose a couple in Africa as well, and been to some very remote regions there. 
but mostly South America, people like the Chimani tribe, and, 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 and that was that was a great experience. So what came out of it? Did you do a documentary? Or? Oh yeah, that was for um, that was for Discovery uh, uh, Europe. Yeah. Oh wow. Oh, so awesome. they generally you want to multitask nowadays too as much as you possibly can. I think there are a lot of directors out there who are saved by the crew that they have around them. They don't necessarily have much of a vision, very loose grip of the technical process, mm -hmm. and maybe a little experience with actors. Um, but they might... Just being a storyteller isn't enough nowadays. And I think as a director, you want to really get to grips with all the kit from beginning to end, from the first second of production to the last sure. bit of post-production and you if you can get a handle on all of that and you know exactly the processes and it's a lifetime process of keeping up with all this stuff because it's constantly changing as well then you will probably end up seeing your vision realized and that's the point of directing seeing your vision realized if you don't if you don't have that grip on all of those those technical processes you'll always rely on a big crew and you'll always rely on a very, very good crew to save your bacon every time. And I think there are a lot of pretty bad directors out there making quite a lot of big movies that they work with the same people every time. Or maybe they just like them and they just you know, oh, often, create a time, often. a team around them. Sometimes that's the case, yeah. So I, are, you, are you saying that a lot of directors are mainly focusing on the pre-production, i.e. the script writing process? or I think I think there are a lot of writers that become directors. Mm -hmm. okay. There are different ways of becoming a director. I suppose you, you can write your own scripts and then insist on directing your own scripts. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Or there are those who uh, make a lot of short films and then they they end up directing a feature and you've got to be very careful about the first feature you direct okay because i think there are a lot of first time feature directors and not very many second time feature directors i think a lot of people take for granted what it takes to make a film a big crew it's people a big that know person. Persons. yeah and it's a actually i've spent my life i think learning every aspect of that right. process yeah to the extent that i could now make a feature film on my own potentially but with actors, as a, as a single crewman with the actors, and I think... You do also the editing? I love all the editing. I've, I've edited all my own stuff for about 20 years since the BBC. You're good at good money. <laughs> to some extent, you need that yeah. in the beginning anyway, I think, because you won't be able to afford a big crew and a very good big crew um, in the very outset. Even on the small projects that you get, if you're working with crew, Often a new director will get bullied and they'll be told, oh, that won't work, that won't work, that won't work. And a lot of people won't know that actually what their vision, their vision will work. It just requires them to understand the process a little bit better to mm -hmm. say, that will work, do what I want you to do. And, yeah, and, and actually, do it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Directing means being sometimes the most unpopular person on set, which is another good reason to learn all the, pro all the jobs yourself so that you, sure. you absolutely can nail everything that you want to do and you know how you want the thing lighting you know the kind of lighting you you know what you're going to do with regard to post-production and the special effects mm -hmm. and what cgi you're going to put in there and how you're going to have to shoot it to enable that and that saves you a lot of money saves you a lot of time and if you know those processes then you you'll get your vision realized i mean a lot of there's a lot of compromise, I think, in the media through people that don't really have a vision and don't really have an understanding of how to gain that. I, I listen to the um, podcast of Kermo de Mayo on the BBC, and so they review new films. And recently, one of the criticisms um, in relation to the last uh, Fast and Furious film, which was released, I think, a couple of weeks ago uh, from a big franchise, which has made more money than uh, Star Wars, by the way, the big franchise of yeah. Fast and Furious. I don't think I've watched any of them, but nonetheless. And so what they were saying is, The Last Fast and Furious is just too much on the special effects side. And it's right. moving all, all over the place and everything is special effects. And yeah. two of, of, of the critics said on that particular podcast, Kermode and Mayo, they should take the example of John Wick 2, where a lot of the stunts are actually done by real people. You yes. know, they're not CGI, yeah. augmented or something. It's funny to see actually that, that a lot of are, um, I mean, allegedly enhanced by visual effects and CGI, but at the same time, the visual effects industry is also dying. Mm. I heard another podcast, Economics, where they were saying the whole 
Californian uh, visual effects industry has just completely disappeared over the years. They had to relocate yes. to Canada because of tax reasons, or, or in Europe, in, in London, because um, visual effects are subcontracted and, and, and it's just there's not enough money in, in that anymore. So um, That's probably true. And it's, it's become so easy for anyone to get into visual effects. Though. Right. Maybe this is why the quality has gone down as well of the visual effects. Well, I think there's no excuse for that. I've seen it in a few films, and the films have always been... I, I think there were one or two films I can't mention that I know people that were involved in them, and I know the reason behind the CGI being being really poor on them. Okay. But generally, it's very easy now to produce good visual effects, and it's very easy to produce almost anything that you might want with CGI. I think storytelling, though, has always been a, an important part of directing. Though earlier I might have said, oh, just people that can storytell and have not the technical ability, I might sound as though I'm contradicting myself, but I actually believe that you the story telling aspect is the very first thing you have to master and then you get everything else as well. I think a lot of people in the industry agree with you that you need a good script, a good story to yeah. tell. Well, I, I, I understand people like Alex Porras are getting a bit upset with the movie industry because they just want to regurgitate. Who is Alex Porras? Oh, Proyas. He, he Proyas. made, um, oh, great films like The Crow, Dark City. Oh, okay. That kind film of, director. Yes, and he, he got pretty upset. He made a film with a friend of mine, uh, a little guy called Knowing, and he doesn't think that Hollywood wants to produce anything but old regurgitated proven formulas that will get the money in. Yeah, to some extent, anyone can make a movie now. The kind of budgets they're spending are on the stars and getting those kinds of characters involved. They have to have a proven uh, formula to get the money in back but storytelling as in the godfather makes that kind of film uh timeless and i can still look back and say that's one of my favorite films ever through the 80s we had great special effects with people like spielberg and george lucas and you look at those films and you think oh marvelous you know absolutely they've, they've changed the whole face of escapism because you can actually believe the vision that they had and they followed it through. Maybe a bit later, Lucas lost the plot a little bit with The Phantom Menace and thought that special effects could still carry him through an entire movie. Whereas, in fact, storytelling is, was always what made his films so great in the early days. And I, I, think, I think you can never let go of that. There is a problem at the moment with money-making, proven formulas, and getting good people involved to, to actually want to do that kind of filmmaking. So. On this note, the money-making process and, and the, the, the proven formula, as you say, I, I belong to a, um, an association of professionals involved in the film industry in Paris called ASECA. So we meet up every two months, etc. And on last Friday, we had this déjeuner, so this uh, lunch, uh, as well as debate. And that was about the film en désirance, so films which are not being exploited. And what do you do with the assets? Now, the film itself, or the... Uh, the assets around the film and when it's not being exploited by the producer well there is an obligation on the French law for a producer to exploit and so I asked out, you know, out of uh, curiosity how many films are not exploited in France and they said only 25% of films being shot are actually exploited and the rest is not I asked the financiers in the room why do you finance such films I mean how come you don't um, check you know, whether there's going to be a sales or distribution package tied into the deal so that you make sure you get your return on your investment. I mean, that's what they do. I, um, talent agencies like CIA and WME in, in Hollywood, why don't we have the same thing in France, or maybe in Europe? So my question to you is, how come Europe seems to be so unprofessional compared to the Hollywood way of doing things where they prepackage the whole thing? I mean, I'm reading at the moment a really useful and interesting book called uh, CAA, The Powerhouse, Building of a Powerhouse, where they explain to you that CAA Creative Artist Agency, which was founded in 1975, they basically have as a roster of clients the best film uh, producers, the best film directors, uh, scriptwriters, and also the best actors and then they just package deals so they take one of their film directors on the on their roster and then they a couple of actors and uh, and then they speak to the sales agents um, and also to big studios to basically arrange a distribution deal and it seems to be so well organized and so a, a really smooth process in in the US and and when I have 
I am under the impression that here in Europe it's much more uh, DIY, so to speak, and with yeah. and, and a lot of vanity projects. I mean, yes. at the end of the day, for only twenty, I mean, at least in France, only twenty-five percent of the films are being exploited commercially. It means that seventy-five percent of the films are just vanity projects by some film directors. So, how do you make sure that you still have this hold on reality and that your film projects are, uh, you know, commercially viable? Yeah, yeah, I think they have some pretty tough producers over in the States as well, and they'll keep you to your script, your schedule, to your budget, and everything else as well. It is a business. Yeah. A lot of the funding actually probably comes through hedge funds and things like that, people looking really? to spend their money on an interesting project, but also uh, to gain some of the tax perks and that kind of thing too. And I know that there are you know, obviously funding bodies here as well, and generally the budgets tend to be a lot smaller than the States, okay. and so it enables you to take a few more risks. And if you do actually just get a small proportion of your films making a, a profit here, and you make, say, seven and one or two of them just get through, the, the budgets are usually so small that you're still going to <laughs> make a profit from the one or two that actually get, get, get made, probably where it's big business. And when you're in the States and you're actually making a lot of money, they are much more on the ball with regard to yeah, keeping you keeping you on the straight and narrow. I've got a friend that's just made a film called The Shack and I think he's This is the guy you who did wrote a script about Moses. Oh yes, yeah. yes Stu. Yeah yeah he's uh I think he's a good guy and he's quite talented and he's just made a film out there and probably had to jump through many hoops to get into that position to make a feature film as well but even then the studio will be very firm and it'll be the studio that produced Life of Pi and other great films that... So who put this film, The Shack? Um, Which I, studio? A major studio? Probably yes and, and they'll be just distributing in the UK in June. Oh, fantastic. Uh, so yeah, yeah. But the kind of thing that I'm involved in at the moment would be very low budget in comparison to that. That had Sam Worthington starring and the kind of thing I'm doing at the moment is I'm, I'm helping a, a young, very talented lad that I mentored for years called Humphrey Pittman, who's an actor, and he's just, through his passion for Shakespeare and, and getting together a budget from wherever he could scrape it, made a one-man show mm -hmm. uh, on Hamlet where he played pretty much all the roles, except for the female ones, and he's just been shooting from the flashbacks, and I'm going to help him with the post-production on that, and I've, I've basically been involved just in an advisory role, but I think he's going to go far, as far as he can go in the UK, as far as he can go in Europe, but one thing that Stu, the guy that the stunt did the shack, told me, even as a scriptwriter, if you want to make a lot of money as a scriptwriter, you go to the States, if you want to not be able to pay your mortgage, you stay in the UK and you, you write scripts. That's where the money is. Well, I mean, a lot of yeah. the talent does live in the UK. I mean, because the UK is a big pool of, of, of talent. There yeah. are many British actors who are often working on the massive uh, Hollywood productions. But I think most of the time they live here in the UK. It goes to Los Angeles back and forth. The ties between London, the, the film business in Hollywood, I think are much stronger yeah. than, for example, Paris and Hollywood. So yeah, I mean, there are a lot of directors that go out there from England, like Stu. There are a lot of um, a lot of the special effects are handled in the UK as well. Mm. And I've got other friends like. Uh, I think it's just for tax reasons. Yes, possibly. And, and we still have good studios. We've got Shepherds and Pinewood, and yeah. a very good friend of mine set up a, a company on leave, leaving the Royal Marines. I'd worked with him on recruitment films when he was still in the Marines. Mm -hmm. He left, and he set up a company called. Uh, uh, military films, military film services uh, limited, which is basically providing all the military extras, military locations uh, for major feature films that are shot over here. So World War Z, he actually got hold of the aircraft carrier for them. He's worked on Kick-Ass 2, which was actually shot in the UK, and they try and make it look, look like it's shot in, in the US, US. Ah. but it actually makes for a more popular film apparently in the ratings when they release it. But yeah, they, he's he's worked on Kingsman uh, mm -hmm. and Kingsman 2, many other films. And they do shoot over here, the studios do come over here. Oh yes, well again, yeah. I think it's basically because the UK has put in place some extremely good tax incentives yeah. or uh, tax rebates. I mean, when I go to the Cannes Film Festival every year, there's this whole 
team from the BFI and who come down. Film UK, I think it's also called, and they explain to you all these tax rebates. For example, Game of Thrones is shot in an island, I think, North, Northern Ireland quite a lot. So uh, that's why they shoot either in Canada, where there's some good tax rebates, or in the UK, there's some uncapped tax rebates. It's a good business. English film has been democratised by the advance of technology, so you've got many, many more people coming into it. So there is fierce competition. Okay, yes, um, that's true. There are no barriers to entry. That's the point I wanted to make before compared, yeah. for example, to fashion where you need to have quite a lot of stock, a lot of money when you start up your fashion business because you need to be able to employ some seamstresses to, you know, hire a factory, etc. But yeah. in a film business, I think there are very low barriers to entry and also a lot of Film projects are unexploitable, as we said, were unexploited because only 25% are commercially exploited, apparently. So it means that for me as a lawyer, when I, I talk to all these film, film types, I don't really see any business opportunities <laughs> because sure. there's not your money around. <laughs> yes, I used to date a girl who worked in a media law company and most of her business was trying to reclaim cash from people that didn't provide the goods for their film okay. and went bust some way part way through and and yeah you there are there are certain rules you don't make your money back from short films you you can possibly make short films as a as, with a view to making a long film you pitch right. your short at can or whatever people generally understand that if you want to be a millionaire don't work in the film business because the music business <laughs> yeah exactly they're few and far between I think one of the rules of sort of the entertainment industry is that it's a one winner takes all economy. So it's only the one percent who are successful or really make a lot of money out of something. The rest is just barely surviving. So it's yeah. it's tough. I mean, for example, for accountants or lawyers, it's not the same. I mean, there are of course much higher barriers to entry into the industry, but then at least more or less everyone makes a decent living. While in creative industry is more difficult because there are lower barriers to entry so only those who are hyper achievers very successful very lucky as well can really make it big yeah I, I think you can narrow the odds you can you can okay. learn the business as well as you possibly can I, obviously there are two sides of that you can learn the creative business you can learn the actual po process of putting a film together and then also if you're running your own company as i am you have to learn pretty quickly the actual process of running a business as well and how to make it profitable and how to keep it going which is uh, not something creative types are always particularly good at which is why they might want to speak with someone like you because they're someone that knows the process knows the law knows the, knows ex the ins and outs and counselors as well yeah exactly right actually narrowing the odds if you work for a long time in a business you gain a consistency and you know how to produce good work that absolutely suits the the client criteria and you know exactly how to how to achieve that to the budget and you can consistently do that you're narrowing the odds of being able to produce and direct and create at the top level and i think your budgets will go up i mean you'll end up you'll start perhaps producing with five thousand pounds to twenty thousand pounds to thirty eventually you'll be on hundreds of thousands of pounds and you'll be able to know how to handle that money and get the most out of it which is always going to be helpful with films and especially films produced in the uk which are going to be probably lower budget generally than those produced in in the states it doesn't mean your quality falls it means that you actually know how to yeah. get the best out of every shoot you do i think that's great advice because it means that there are um, if you follow a certain rigorous process then as you say you, you should end up somewhere, really. Don't be too too keen to create your first movie when you're very new to the business. Sure, sure, because, sure. Uh, as I said, there are many uh, first-time movie directors, very few second-time movie directors. And if you mess up on your first one and you have any kind of budget, then you're not likely to get a second one. And so to get your first feature, you, you pretty much need to know exactly what you're doing. And that really helps, and it helps in the people that you hire as well. If you're not going to shoot everything yourself, edit everything yourself and do it that way, you'll need to be directing them very closely. So you'll need to be getting very, very good people on board as well that can achieve those kind of effects that you're, you're going for. It's, it's a matter of seeing a vision through sure. from, from the very outset, and you need to be a storyteller. Um, I met in Cannes last year a film producer, Johnson Devin, I think. Uh, and then I caught up with him at the Berlinale in February, in Berlin, obviously. I was very surprised by the fact that he's much more interested in the creative side of the process than in raising the money. And oh yeah, totally. 
I was, like, I thought that this was a whole thing of being a film producer, you know, that you would be more, you would be managing the whole process of organizing everything for the film director and also getting all the money and the, the distribution of the, of the film in place, while the film director would be doing the creative process, but he seemed to think otherwise. So how do you, do you uh, work often in pairs with a, a film producer when you are a director, or you, do you prefer to do both? Or I mean, what's your view on the role of the film producer? It's a mixed bag, I think, because you, you start off, um, well, I started off in the creative side of things with 3D animation, but I became a producer. And then I really wanted to get back to directing. I had directed animation, so I tried that. Yeah. Producing and directing is a very good way to keep control and power of your, over your projects too. And I pretty much know what I'm achieving and how much it's going to cost and what I need and the time I need to spend on each uh, location and shoot. And if I'm getting gold on that location and if it, if it supersedes another scene possibly and I can... So I'm pretty ruthless with myself. A lot of the time, you, if you're dealing with a lot of people, and you're, it's a matter of not having enough hands to do all the jobs. So you want to work with the producer you get on well with that trusts you. If the producer doesn't trust you, they'll be quite hard on each scene you're shooting, asking you to move on to the next. So that is a good reason to work with people you know and trust. Well, well you, you basically know that you're going to stay within certain boundaries and that you can achieve what you say you're going to yeah. achieve. Producing it can be a lot like accounting. Um, exactly, yeah. Or it can be very creative. It depends on the kind of project you're working on, who you're working with. I, I used to be a creative producer, so my, my role was a director, really, at the BBC, and, and, a, and a creative producer. And because I've been a producer for a long time prior to joining the BBC, I had made sure that that was on my contract with them, because normally they only accept people as assistant producers and that kind of thing into their and I've, I've, I've launched several companies by that stage, so it, it, it really varies on the project and, it, and I think the deal's made at the very beginning, what kind of power someone's going to have. Normally the producer will be telling the director, okay, that's the limit of our budget now, let's go to the next location, or we've got to stop here, we've got to... Sometimes it's very good to keep the director in check, especially if he thinks he's a mad genius uh, and he's going to blow the entire budget on one scene. Yeah. Stanley Kubrick apparently was quite famous for that. Who was Stanley Kubrick. Oh, he was yeah. doing take after take after take after take. It was exhausting all his actors. There's a certain billionaire in history as well, wasn't there, um, who, who he thought he could direct films. And obviously he didn't need a producer because he had a, all his own money to throw at these things. But studios Who's probably that? quite tight. Uh, was that Howard Hawks? Ah, right, yeah, yeah. Um, was he been there, really? I, 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 I need to look at my history, goodness knows. But I think if you, unless you've got that kind of money in your back pocket, uh, yeah, yeah, you need a producer. Coming yeah. from Houston and maybe making money at the fall, yeah, yes. Where do you see the future of the film industry going? With this revolution, which is very well explained in Side by Side, the documentary produced, I think, and made by Kenny Reeves, he explains really clearly how now almost everything is done on digital. Yes. And even the theatres yes. are showing digital copies of films. Yes. So, where do you see the future of the film industry going in terms of technically and also in terms of how to distribute the content, theatre wise and, and the internet? <laughs> it's, it's hard to know. I mean, I think it's going to be technology driven. What are the biggest technology trends at the moment? It's very hard to go by a trend because we thought 3D TV was going to be a big thing and then it turned out to fall flat completely. I don't like 3D, but I, I, when I was at the Canfield Festival, I, I had the option to try and put some 3D stuff on my face and then just lie down on some sort of couch and just pretend that I was in the air, just, you know. Oh, virtual reality. Oh, well, right, sorry, yes, virtual reality. Oh, yeah. I got so sick in the stomach. I mean, <laughs> all afternoon I had the impression I had been uh, sailing at sea with a rough gale. This virtual reality and 3D is just a fad for me. I don't, think it's I don't know, because I think even the nature of making a 3D film is different to making a film that you know is going to be on a flat screen 2D. You can't cut too much, you can't be too cutting edge with your flickery effect, say as in Gamer, which is very much seen as a cutting edge type of film. If you try to put it in 3D, everyone would be, as you say, sick on the couch. Because, uh, but if you, if you look at something like Avatar, the shots had to be slower, more flowing. Much better of Avatar. Well, basically, because you had a head, you, you were wearing glasses and yeah. you were in the 3D environment. I loved it. 
to break that was very uncomfortable for the viewer. The whole language of film could potentially change with the advance of technology, whether it be VR or a chip in our head, who knows? I, because it, it's, it's kind of, who knows where it's going? I mean, they say that in 2045, our, the chip in our shoe will be 50 times the IQ, an IQ of 10,000 of a human being, exactly. It's very hard to know where it's going uh, because everything's accelerating as well. Okay. Technology is accelerating, which is why nowadays I used to buy cameras all the time and try to keep up to date with them. Now I rarely bother it because is, it is. every job requires a different type of camera and different types of lenses and you'll end up spending hundreds of thousands of pounds on that kind of kit. It'll change in six months time anyway. Yes, you might as well hire. I, as to whether that's going to happen with the computer systems when, when we get these Unity type systems coming in. Goodness knows. I, I do what, see... What's that? Sorry, Unity type systems? I, I've forgotten the actual name of them, but they're talking about computers which are far, far more advanced than we have now. That quantum computers, basically. That, that can effectively... At the moment, they're, they're only good at being programmed to produce one sort of task, but they're saying that in 10 years' time, quantum computers will have a higher IQ than human beings. So... Yes. We have no idea where that could possibly take us. So how is that going to impact so, the films? Every now and then I'm swearing at my computer and thinking I'm wasting half my life waiting for something to render on Maya or in, in, in some uh, compositing program. Yeah. And I think that will make the whole filmmaking process much, much quicker because you'll have a much, almost a real-time high-definition sequence coming out as quickly as you can produce it. It will make the whole filmmaking process a lot easier and again will democratise it. But I think um, that's where we're going. As long as you can buy your quantum c computer, which might be probably quite expensive initially. Yeah, we'll probably all be their slaves by then, so I don't think we'll need to <laughs> worry too much about it. <laughs> but uh, we'll see. Happy, well, happy times ahead then. I do worry, actually, I'm talking about Alex Proyas' concern about yeah. the whole way the movie industry is going and its formulaic approach to films. Essentially, with given that, you could create an algorithm and dispense with directors and producers and leave the computer to create our entertainment from scratch. Might be a bit boring. I don't know. Content. I don't know. I think a lot of stuff coming out of Hollywood could be challenged by that. So. <laughs> Fair enough. That was an interesting perspective, but you see the technology having such a big impact on content being produced in the future. It certainly has over the last 10 years, so right. I, I, and and, and it's accelerating. In terms of how this content is being dis distributed, Every time I go back to France, I really do have the impression that those continental Europeans are so far behind. I mean, for them, the only two distribution channels which are, are worth mentioning are TV set and theatres. And for me, those are two distribution channels which are not really current and, and relevant anymore. Kids hardly ever go to the, to the cinema, I think. They're not used to being sat down for two or three hours in, in a row uh, watching a film. I've never watched TV in my life. I've never had a TV set. For me, it's Many of uh, all the people who watch TV, really. When I come back to the UK, and definitely when I go to the US, I have the impression that the, the general public is much more in um, adequacy with the new distribution channels like yeah. Netflix, Amazon Prime, and watching on your tablet, your laptop, but also illegal channels because a lot of people are moaning that the content you watch on Netflix and Amazon Prime is not basically very, uh, very new. First, there is a theatre window for the release and, and, and then one year later you can see the content online. So how do you see all this evolving? What is your view about how we're going to consume content? I think you can look at the music industry and take a warning from that. Distribution companies that were labels in the old days, they usurped largely by people distributing online, by MP3 download. Digital. Streaming. Streaming, yeah, exactly. It's very hard to know where things going but it does seem as though Things are being integrated more and more, games are getting closer to movies. Okay. They're all becoming more and more immersive and the technology that you have is much more easy to hold in your hand so you can now easily watch a movie on your Samsung. Yeah. This was sort of technology that you looked at in 82, watching something like Blade Runner, yeah. you know, with a, a video phone call and thought, oh gosh, that's so far away. But Was that in Blade Runner, really? Because it's one of my favourite films. Oh, mine too. I wrote my thesis on Blade Runner. By this time, it was really science fiction. Yes, but it's accelerating so quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Elon Musk is talking about putting a chip, an interactive interface with our brains together that's going to, going to work. So choosing the format of your film and choosing the outcome of your film is probably going to be a, or your virtual reality or your game 
Well, I think it's going to become much, much more immersive. It's all dependent from, on the technology. Yeah, we'll look back as we do at some old films and think, gosh, how primitive the language is there. And the language is always changing in the film. And you've got people at the cutting edge always looking very dated. 10, 20 years past the time when they were cutting edge. What do you mean the language changes? The filmic language that you used to talk to people. So there, there was a lot of play made, especially in the early noughties and the, the late nineties, of jump cuts and flash frames and, and creating something where the film is very self-conscious and you're creating something that may people feel like they were watching a music video <laughs> and I, I've, I've indulged in a lot of that kind of stuff myself but as it becomes more immersive you're forgetting the technology more you're moving much more into the fantasy world and it, it the language is getting much closer to our actual reality of our day to day i think that's where we're sort of going we're going to an alternate reality with technology that is going to become more and more integrated. A bit in the way that Danny Boyle filmed um, Slumdog Millionaire, where he just had a camera, just one camera that he could move around with. Yeah, he was always on the move when he was doing that film. Well, I shot some joint service adventure training stuff for the military in, in, the, in 2007. And GoPro came out straight after that with, and the whole way out of filmed all our skiing, diving, skydiving, everything else would have been entirely different. I was using massive underwater cameras, I was skiing down mountains with some massive camera over my shoulder oh virtually, my God. and climb, dangling off cliffs holding these big things too. And nowadays you wouldn't dream of shooting it that way. You have drones, you have right. very simple, very high definition and very beautiful ways of filming things, which is what all I've used nowadays. Even the way you shoot stuff has changed. And eventually we'll probably end up with some eye camera, goodness knows, and we'll end up living someone else's reality. Jesus, you don't seem to be... Because for me, it's, I find it quite disgusting, you know, a chip on your brain or a chip on your, on your body or... You, you don't seem to have a feeling of disgust. Well, for me, it's just really disgusting to well, add something I, to your body. I think almost a lot of, a lot of jobs nowadays are, are accepting that. They're going to lose their jobs to technology to some extent. Really? Do yeah, you? I think so. I think, uh, sadly for you, I think law was one of the ones that was mentioned in the five jobs that are definitely going to be taken over by AI. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, I, I really do see an AI going to a, a stand at the bar and, uh, and pleading, pleading at, the, at, the, at the bar. It's not possible. AI is going to be useful to do a lot of research more quickly and drafting, churning the documents, which frankly, I'm just waiting for that day to arrive. But I think we will still need for negotiations or trials, we will still need the human beings to be there to do the work. But what why not? Frankly, I'm, I don't feel too challenged by... Uh... No, sure. No. AI or the technology at the moment is accommodating our advances to, to escape, escapism and, and entertainment. Hopefully it will always be something that just entertains and <laughs> we won't get into some kind of matrix nightmare where we're all batteries supporting this great big AI, oh, yeah, but yeah, 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 we are up. That, for example, is typically yeah. the sort of thing that would disgust me, you know, to have this sort of cable just plugging at the top of your, your neck here. Well, you see, having written my thesis on Blade Runner, yeah. which I suppose you could equate very closely to... It's about to, replicants, so they're robots. Yes, yeah. and Metropolis, and the idea of the robot taking over, and the technology taking over, and becoming... You're talking about Metropolis, a film? Yes. The, I haven't watched it, yeah, okay. Oh, One Chris of the best Lang, films. great yeah. films. Watch, One but of the best films in history. Yeah, yeah. It was a, a warning, uh, a bit tongue in cheek, and it also, was also the type of film that I like to watch. And so I suppose my. I love the fact that technology is democratized and I can pretty much produce anything from my from my office now, uh, film wise or video wise, almost to any, any sort of spec that my client wants. But yeah, there's that little warning, <laughs> alarm bell in the back of your head. That is, is telling you where is this asking you where is this taking us? Where are we going with this? For me, it's it's not so much alarm bells ringing. It's more I think I'm quite keen, you know, on understanding all the potential of these these changes to come. Even for the legal business, as you were saying, since I'm a lawyer, I'm also quite keen to see what's going to happen because I think it's going to help us to focus on the things where we can add value and stuff spending hours on research and stuff like that. I mean, I'd be, I'd love to have an AI being able to do that instead of my junior or, you know, me sometimes. I'm, I'm actually quite excited by all these 
possibilities. I don't yeah. see it as a threat. What, what I find disgusting is to actually add something on your body to enhance your your experience that you're going to get, of some content because you have it directly in your brain or in your eye or or, or because you also want to enhance your capabilities and your skills. That very much leads into the, the Unabomber Manifesto or Theodore Kaczynski and the idea of political correctness and, and the changing of what it is to be a human being subject to as he thought, certain conditioners. Theodore Kaczynski was much more concerned about the technology we use and saying that what ultimately starts off as an entertainment gimmick to show off to your friends ends up being essential to your business. Mm. So a laptop or an iPhone or anything else, sure. ultimately you end up having to have that to run a business and, and all the programs therein. And so you, you basically do become, to some extent, subject to the technology in order to, to run anything efficiently because other people will always use that. Yes. So if, if ever you had to have this add-on to your brain, which I think for me right hand, I mean, I, I think if my competitors were getting away from me, uh, I'd be very tempted to add a few gigabytes up there, you know what I mean? Oh my God. Terabytes. Thank you so much, Phil. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Lawfully Creative, produced by Crefovi Studios. Subscribe to our podcast or catch up with our original shows on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube and SoundCloud. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to Crefovi and its lawyers on contact at crefovi.com.